Okay. We're ready to rock. All right, if everyone could take seats. Appreciate it. We will get rolling. Good evening, I'm Lucinda Andriani. I serve as Deputy County Manager as well as the Flood Control District Administrator. And uh, we're here tonight for a kickoff meeting with the Government Tank Flood Corridor. Um, you know, the, we're, we are ready to, we've done some conceptual work, but we're ready to launch really into the engineering process. So it's really important that that you understand the, the whole process that's involved and the hundreds of steps that need to be accomplished to actually get construction underway and then get through construction. It's really important that you understand that and you understand um, the necessity for a tremendous amount of cooperation from the area if we're going to be able to construct before the next monsoon season. Because this is the single largest and largest flood corridor that the district's ever taken on. And uh, it's extremely complex, both on and off forest. And so we have uh, um, ahead of us, we, we collectively have ahead of us uh, Herculean effort if we're going to bring the massive amount of construction that has to take place before monsoon next season to have that accomplished, to get through all the steps that have to have to take place. And we're going to walk through all that. So tonight, it's going to be a fairly long presentation, but a lot of background and understanding about what's involved in the process. You're going to see some conceptual information very little related to what's in the neighborhood at this point. We have some more work to do before we can get to the 30% level where we'll come and then we'll have plans and we'll have a meeting, but then we'll break up and look at the plans. We will have some information, specific information related to the on forest. But um, tonight is really about understanding the process and what's going to be necessary for this to move forward and what is going to be an extremely short period of time. Remember, to get to the point we are now, it took three years after Shoals. So we are fortunately three years ahead of where we were. With that, I want to introduce the team. Uh, we've been, we are very fortunate here. We just had a contingent here from New Mexico. If you may know, last year they had the calf, um, the calf, what was the other half? Hermit's Peak fire, 350,000 acres much, much more significant, huge number of watersheds involved. They were just here and, um, and spent a couple days with us. And it made me, uh, they're, they're having a lot of challenges, a tremendous amount of challenges um, on a whole set of levels, uh, starting from governance all the way through. But um, even though they have a lot of financial resources, there are a lot of issues that they're having. And we spent a couple days with them trying to help them um, collectively move themselves forward. And, but what it really spoke to is one, the value that we had having the experience both through Schultz and Museum, and that we've been able to bring that team back now that has a level of experience that is nowhere found nowhere else in the country. And so we've been extremely fortunate. So I want to introduce that team. Uh, first, I want to start with Alan Hayden with Natural Channel Design. Alan and his firm um, are responsible for all the on forest engineering, so all the measures, and he's got a set of slides that he'll walk through this evening talking about what are the measures. And the on forest measures are the game changer. That's the game changer. If we can't keep the sediment up there, Anything we construct below won't work. It'll just fill up with in sediment in minutes, frankly, and it won't effectuate any flood mitigation. So that work is, is critical to all this. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Mark Lamer uh, with Raymall Engineering and Lizzie. Lizzie, stand up. 
um, Lizzie and Mark and uh, a couple of other associates with their firm are the engineers for the off force measures. So the neighborhood and flood mitigation, they'll be doing that engineering work. Uh, to the left of Lizzie is Julie Lead with Peak Engineering. Julie helps manage all of the technical elements of supporting me with that process. Uh, and uh, she's been involved with us through museum and, uh, and now with Schultz Pipeline. So, and then let's see who else we have a uh, couple of folks this evening with us that work with our, with a firm called Tierra Rightaway Services. They will be the ones working with those. Those of you that we need, we expect that we will need a set of drainage easements to effectuate the mitigation through the neighborhood and they will be the people that will be working with you on securing the drainage easements. And it's Shanique and Nikki uh, will be the primary contact people for, for that process. All right, is there anybody else external to the district? Then I wanna also introduce the district. Oh, Corey, sorry, Corey. Corey Helton, engineer with J.E. Fuller Hydrology. And they are the ones that have produced all the flood maps that you've seen um, that show where the flooding's taking place, the depth, they've modeled you know, the various storm events. They did all the burn severity modeling. Um, they're my first phone call when we get a fire. I call one of his associates, Joe, and say rev up the modeling. And from day one, they start preparing those models. And, and the, um, we, this last November, we conducted another what's called LIDAR flight. It's a light emitting radar type process that provides us with very detailed topographic information. And the maps that you're seeing have been updated since the flooding that took place last summer. So, and that, that information is really critical to the engineering process, particularly on forest, but also, also off forest. And that also guides what we do in terms of our short-term mitigation in terms of sandbags and barriers as well. So Corey and Jay Fuller, they also conduct, and Corey will be speaking to this tonight, uh, there's a whole process that we go through called no adverse impact analysis that determines that anything that we propose to do, any measures that we propose, that we determine whether or not there are impacts either upstream or downstream. If those impacts are greater than the national standard for those impacts, then we have to mitigate those impacts. We have to either reduce the size of that structure, change the location. You know, we have to modify that to ensure there are no adverse impacts, either upstream or downstream. And that, I think for Wupaki Trails, which we just, we're just in the process of nearing completion, we um, ran that modeling probably at least a good 15 times. And for this corridor, it'll probably be 20 to 30 times. And last but not least is Mike Garrison with Tiffany Construction. Tiffany is, um, uh, was the successful party uh, that has, uh, it will be doing all the on forest work. They went through a competitive process. Um, frankly, there wasn't much of a competition because they had performed uh, the vast majority of the work post Schultz and have done, were successful competing for the work in museum. And uh, they'll be performing all the work on forest. Uh, in this corridor, the off forest, we will still be going through a procurement process for those contractors. They will probably compete for that. They will be very competitive for that work as well. They currently are, They've completed work in the two paintbrush corridors, both on and off forest, Campbell corridor, on and off forest, have a little more work to do in Campbell, up high in the, in the drainage. Um, and then they completed all the work in Brandis and they are nearing completion in Wupaki Trails. So they're a phenomenal uh, organization and um, the fact that they've been able to get that work done is just pretty amazing. Um, again, another really key component of this team. And they were a key component all through Schultz and Museum as well. So I think that's our team. Did I miss anybody? 
Well, well our, our district team, let me introduce Sean Golightly, our communications and community relations manager, Casey Jenkins, our, our program manager, Sean Guioma is our business manager. He manages, writes all the checks. Casey Auberly is our intern. And Shirley, Shirley Watkins is my right-hand person. Is anybody else here that I'm not seeing? I think that's it. So I'll come back to you. Let me get rolling here. He is not. Right now, the National Association of Counties Conference is going on. And he and I think all of the rest of the supervisors are at that, our, our once a year annual conference for counties. So he is not here, but he will be here in future, at future meetings. He and your, your, your future supervisor, Lena Fowler, because Lena Fowler, due to redistricting, will be your future supervisor starting in 24. So, so with that, I'm gonna leap in here Got a little bit of background we're going to go through. Um, I will forewarn you, we've got a fair amount of information to cover. I think this is a slide that we had that we've updated that we went through with you back in September and probably and since then to some extent uh, of what, what occurred last year. I think everybody's aware of 45 major flood events. Um, and But one of the things that's important to point out is that the largest storm that was recorded in the gauges. Now we know we had rainfall greater to that in some areas. Obviously their gauges aren't everywhere so they don't capture every drop of rainfall obviously. But you can see here the government tank major storms that were recorded in the gauges. You know, the largest storm that we recorded was a 10 year storm. So we have not seen the storm that has been modeled, the two inch in 45 minutes, which is a 25 year storm post fire. That has not happened yet. That's happened nowhere in the flood area yet. So although we're having a late start and, what, and the weather service is continuing to say that this might be a near non-soon, you may have another monsoon more similar to 2019 and 2020. Um, but we also, they're also saying, irrespective of that, you always can get larger events. Um, so hopefully everyone is prepared. And we had an area-wide meeting some month or so, month and a half ago to talk about that. This is what was accomplished through last summer. Uh, we ultimately ended up spending a little over $9 million between short-term mitigation and response costs. We're in the process now of constructing, uh, as I said, we're just finishing up, constructing about $35 million worth of flood mitigation and on-forest measures. Uh, we tackled the, the corridors where we had existing mitigation because that process was able to be expedited. We, it was, it was, uh, we had the vast majority of all the drainage easements we needed. We had uh, the agreements already in place, Forest Service. We were able to secure some funding fairly quickly for some of the off-forest measures. Um, and so we moved forward with that. I know there are people that are angry about that, but let me tell you that is huge because now that work is done. So now we can focus on this corridor and the other two corridors that do not have, did not have mitigation. And otherwise we would have been starting with this work at least a year later. So, and that's a real tribute to this team. Everybody was working seven days a week, long hours. Tiffany's team's been working seven days a week, 12 hours, 15 hours a day to get all that work done. This is a map that shows that, that work that was accomplished. Um, and uh, so that's good. We can now refocus onto this area. So as you well know, this is a great photograph that shows the significance of the burn. And I don't know if this will work. Yes, it will. And this is, this is your watershed up here, up against Schultz, Schultz Peak. 
And it's all this area back in here that burned extremely severely, and the water comes around the bend and comes all the way down here uh, to your neighborhood. And uh, the most fortunate thing, if there's a silver lining in all this, is that there is a lot of work that can be done above the neighborhood uh, where that water, where that land flattens out. It's called an alluvial fan, and Alan's going to walk all through. But fortunately, there's a tremendous amount of work that can be done up there that will have a very positive effect downstream. And Alan will talk a lot more about that. So as you will recall, you've seen this graph, um, those of you that have participated in prior meetings, the flood flows in this area against what was in 2016 post Schultz are 26 times greater than they were then. And um, so we've seen a dramatic increase in flood, flood flows here in this corridor. You certainly know that those impacts were significant. And I'll reiterate, this will be the most challenging corridor that we've ever undertaken. But I have full confidence that this team can master that. The wild card is you. Will we get the cooperation that we need to be able to fulfill the plan? So I want to talk just initially about some of the steps. Like I said, we have for this corridor alone, I think we're up to what Casey and Julie, a six page action plan <laughs> that probably has, I don't know, a couple hundred, 300 steps to it. Um, significant number of steps that we need to go through. But the number one first action for you to consider and hopefully take is to provide the district with what's called a right of entry. I'll go into more detail about what that means in a little bit. Uh, but for us to be able to start and initiate the engineering process, to really get into the engineering process, we need to be able to access your property to do survey, to be able to do archeological survey, uh, so we can get the clearances that are needed for the for both our process and the funders process. Um, there's a, a number of activities that have to take place for the engineers to have the information to be able to actually engineer the measures. So, and we have to have that ability to enter your property, conduct that work. It doesn't allow us to construct anything. All it is is for access during engineering. No construction. And we have a set of forms outside, and I really would ask that you sign those forms and that that's the first step. You know, if you want to think about voting, that's your first vote. Second vote's drainage easement. First vote is this. There's really, this is so we can ultimately present you with a plan. And they, they, we will get you a copy, yes. So we need to secure the right of entry so that engineering can proceed. You know, we have to locate utilities. We have to survey, determine where your septic systems are, where your water lines are, et cetera. Some of the other steps, uh, we're in a process now. In fact, we will likely, probably within a couple of weeks, we will be going out for uh, a construction contractor for various pieces of this plan, the ultimate plan. Uh, we're using a methodology called construction manager at risk. It gives us the most flexibility. Uh, our goal is to have that contractor on board. We have to, it has to be out for a minimum 30 days, but to have that contractor on board in September so they can begin to provide value engineering and input to the, and the engineering process. In terms of the on forest, We've received the clearances for the vast majority of the area that we need for the on-forest measures. There may be, depending upon the engineering, there may be some additional area we need, but the Forest Service expedited that process, worked really well with us, so those clearances have been secured. Um, I, I mentioned before that we do this, conduct this no adverse impact analysis. That's done actually at the 
at, at the 30, 60, and 90 level uh, of engineering, and that will be presented to you, so you will see those results. Secure the drainage and easements and mortgage releases. So most of us have a mortgage. Some people are fortunate to own their home outright, and they may not have a mortgage, but most of us do. We think we own the house. We don't. The mortgage company does. So anytime you sign any type of easement or anything involving your property in terms of the rights, um, it requires that the mortgage company also provide a release. They tend to be very challenging to work with. The few we've had to do so far have been, been good. Um, we will frankly rely on our congressional members. They helped tremendously during Schultz and Kirkpatrick and her office were instrumental in getting mortgage companies to pay attention. This is a disaster. We need you to step up and provide the release. They basically sign off and say, yes, we concur that these measures you know, need to take place. I think the other, obviously we're gonna need uh, the funder for the off-force measures is the Natural Resources Confer Conservation Service. They'll need to approve all plans, the costs. U.S. Forest Service, of course, approves all the plans on forest. And then the, ultimately the Flood Control District Board has to approve. We also need to secure what we call the National Environmental Policy Act approvals off forest. So NRCS requires that process. And that's why we need to be able to do the archeological survey to determine if any of the corridors that will be working in any of those alignments for channels, storm drain, drainage facilities, detention facilities, those all have to be cleared uh, before we can complete engineering and then go to construction. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Corey who's going to walk through a little bit of the background on the flood modeling and just hit the high points of that so you have a sense of the dynamics Important to understand what we're at about 4,000 CFS at the, the forest boundary, about 3,800, 4,000 CFS. I think the largest other volume is what in the uh, Wupaki 2200? About 2200, yes. 2200, and they saw about a 13 to 15 times increase in flood flow. So this is a magnitude of problem is really significant here. So take it away, Corey. And on on this slide here, we'll just this is you've already seen this, and I'll just point out that what Lucinda was talking about, why yours is so much higher, is the high burn severity that she was pointing out that you had um, twenty two percent in high burn severity up on the Weatherford area, and so that that is what's contributing to the high flows that you. That's right, right. So this is all fresh burn area. Um, but it, it had the most high, highly burn severity of all the other watersheds up here. And that's why we're seeing such a, a large increase in flows. And, and I wanna say sorry for, for you that have been experiencing those high flows. And I, I, I hope that what we're showing you tonight in the modeling is helping with the mitigation and, and then ultimately long-term mitigation as well. Um, so, Coming into the switchback area, we got about 3,500 um, CFS coming down and hitting the highway and overwhelming the highway, going into the solar field, over overtopping the walls at that location and 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 affecting the church here as well. Um, so so these are this is the Hutchinson Acres and coming off of a different watershed, um, but it still has 1,500 over on this area, and that's contributing to the same basin areas along the highway that government tank is. Um, and these, are, these maps are based off of the two inches and 45 minutes. Um, that, that's about a 25 year event. Um, and I'll just, Right here, we had some flows coming through here. Um, we didn't have the two inch event, so it didn't push through the fences um, here. So we ended up having more flooding down in this area 
than the model would suggest for the two inch event. And, and the reason is, is it burned up against the fence and then diverted itself down and around. Right, right. And so um, you can see as it goes through Joni Park, we're dropping off a lot. So we're allowing for infiltration in the model. We're, 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 we're taking an effect of the soil types and, and the ability to, to infiltrate into the ground. But even so, it's, it still has a lot of flow going through Joni Park. And because it's so flat and it's able to pool up. Yes. OK. Um, is that any better? Yeah, that's that hurts me. All right. Um, and so we'll touch on the non-adverse impact analysis. And so we're taking our, our base modeling, and we perform this for the one inch, um, the two inch, and the three inch storm events. And what we're looking at is we, we want to make improvements. And we wanted to take some of that velocity out of the flows that are coming down towards you. And that will do a great benefit of decreasing the amount of sediment that is being delivered to your, water, uh, to your parcels. And, 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 then, and then the next thing, we can't really stop the water, but we have to figure out a way to convey that water down through the channel. So, uh, so that's what we'll be talking about with our long-term mitigation. We need to drop off the sediments up, up, up on the fans. We need the right of entries to be able to come in to assess how we're going to let the water come through without impacting um, the houses. Um, so to identify that, we're going to look at the one-inch storm event. Um, and we don't want to see any increase of a uh, a tenth of a foot of flow on any locations outside of wherever our corridors or flows are. Um, for the two inch event, we don't want that to be increasing by more than a half a foot. And the three inch event, which is about a hundred year storm event, um, we don't want to see any increases greater than a foot. We're also concerned about velocities. Um, we don't want to see uh, an increase in velocity greater than one foot per second. Um, and if it's greater than three feet per second. So if you have flows greater than three feet per second, that's, that's the threshold where you're not going to be able to grow grasses. So that, that's going to start eroding the soils. And so that anything less than that, we're not concerned about as well. But if it gets above three feet per second, we don't want to increase the velocity by 10% or a foot per second. And those are national standards that are set type of no impact right and that's the, those were things that we had in place for the Schultz fire and the museum and, and so forth um, so for for your government tank watershed coming out of the forest for the one inch you'd expect about a thousand CFS um, for the two inch event you would expect about four thousand CFS and then um, for three inches, you would expect about 8,000 CFS cubic feet per second. Sorry. Yep. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like, the mapping coming through. And the light blue is 0.2 to a half a foot of depth. So these areas right here, would, would the model would suggest that we'd get about a up to a half a foot of flows. And then the darker blue is up to a half, uh, one foot. And then the dark greens are um, one feet to two feet. And then the lighters, green is two to three. And the reds are, are four to five feet of depth of flow that you would expect going through, through your neighborhood. Um, again, this is for the one inch. This is what it would look like with the two inch. This again, this is not a storm that you have experienced so far. Um, so with the two inch event, you would expect more flow than you've seen experienced so far. Yeah. Range, yeah, 1.7. Yep, that's that's a good approximation. One and a half to one point seven range um, is what you experience the most on, on for your entire watershed area. Um, and then if you were to get a three inch event, this is, this is what it would look like. 
Um, and I guess we'll just kind of talk about the long-term mitigations of the on-force and off-force aspects. Yeah, I'll touch on that. Sure. So where are we at on that map? So switch back. This is switch back right here. This is your highway. This is your solar solar plant and Heffel Drive right here. Oh, um, it's it's about nine hundred CFS. Um, that that has capacity in clear water conditions. So if we after eight on cleans the drainage ditch, right? Which they haven't done since. Yeah, the it it'll fill up instantly. It really maintenance makes this feel good, but with this amount of millions of tons of sediment that's coming down, it it, it disappears as you all saw last year instantly, right? Yeah, yeah. Not not with the level of sediment. It'll fill up with sediment. All those those crossings. And the one further to the south is only 36 inch culvert. So those all that's why the road overtopped, right? So it did function to some extent, but there was so much sediment that yeah, it's you know, we saw that Mike cleaned out the the terminal trench that we had up at Wupaki, what, seven times last year? <laughs> Thirteen times, thank you. Seven feet, thirteen times. Yeah, it's just these this this type of soil and post burn conditions is just these watersheds are all unraveling. If you drive up there, you'll see these massive channels and all that sediments in your neighborhood. <laughs> and Alan will talk about why, <laughs> since show you pictures about why. So the, the four to five feet, right? Yeah. Can you clarify real quick that 1.7 range? Um, it was primarily up on the upper portion of the watershed. Um, so it really only hit, it hit the high burn severity area, um, but it, it really only hit maybe it, less than a quarter of the watershed up in there. And is that the July, July, July 14th event? That's correct. Yeah. And all that got recorded was, what got recorded was a look. Yeah, that, that's another thing that the models assume is the rainfall is distributed over the entire watershed um, with the same rainfall distribution. And that rainfall distribution yeah. is based off of some real storm events that have happened in the past. July what 23rd. We, what we found is that, that in the, some of the, um, the, the rainfall in this mountain is more more intense than the typical um, re engineered rainfall distribution that you can get. So we've made that adjustment within our models as well, based off of the rainfall that we've collected for the past 10 years plus on these, on these watersheds. Great, thank you, Corey. So moving into this next section, I, you know, I wanna make a few comments first that I understand your tremendous frustration and there's no, you know, you, are, you have a right to be frustrated. It is extremely upsetting situation that you're going through. This is, this is life threatening flows. Um, they're a threat to you, to your children, to your pets, to your animals, um, the threat to your homes, which for most of us are our largest investment. So, we under I, I get that and and but what I'm going to ask you to do with us is and we can all sit here and say what could have been done what should have been done and spend a lot of time you know debating the past but at this point we have to turn forward and we have to look forward and we have to march forward if if this group of people decides no we're not going to march forward this isn't what we want to happen in this area that's fine, it's ultimately your decision. When we went through Schultz, we had two corridors that elected not to mitigate. Pretty significant percentage of people in those corridors now regret that they didn't then, 
but none of us were really thinking about a reburn. Frankly, we weren't as conscious of that probability. Certainly we are very much so now. We're changing how we're designing our systems because this area will burn again. We know that now. Knew that for two years ago. Yeah, we, we, and we knew that there would be some reburn, certainly in this corridor, because it burns so little that there likely would be. But the other corridors that we were able to move forward with mitigation and those we didn't, there wasn't as much consideration. And there was some level of reduction in those corridors, and they did see a reduction over time. But as soon as that burn hit, the new burn burned higher up. It reburned that entire area. Um, you know, it it made, created these increases in flows. So um, so again, I hope that you'll look forward with us. That will be able to effectuate a plan that's going to improve your your personal safety that will improve your property values and allow you to move forward and hopefully have some greater normalcy in your life over the long term. Sure. Yeah, you bet. And and this the presentation will be online. And so if you want to go in and print off, it's 50 slides. So I'll be honest, we did the three slide. And I, I agree. I know it's hard to see. Sure. Sure. So yeah, and, and so the very light blue is 0.2 to point feet. Feet. Point feet of depth of water, depth of water. Well, this is in the two, this one's in the two inch storm over the entire watershed. And then as you move up, Corey, you're in the, yeah. And we're looking at the one inch, the two inch, and the three inch. Storm. Right. That's what will be modeled through the no adverse impact. So we can't create adverse impacts at any of those three types of rainfall events. That's what is the standard to look at to determine, again, are we creating upstream or downstream? So and then when you get to the little bit darker blue, it's a half foot to a foot. And then the next is the green. It's one foot to two feet. The lighter green is two to three feet. The kind of yellow is three to four. And then the orange is four to five. And there's also, well, no, that map doesn't show this, right? Um, and then, then the uh, purple is the magenta is kind of greater than five feet. OK, you bet. You said no adverse impact. Define that. It it goes back to this criteria. There's the criteria. If what we do, construct a channel, put in a storm drain, develop a detention basin, um, any of those measures that we plan, they model those measures at those three rainfall levels and determine if any area within that planning area, is there any location that's having this greater than that level of increase in depth or greater than that increase in the velocity? So we can't increase the velocity over a certain level. We can't increase the depth over a certain level. Let me tell you how this plays out. So I told you in Wapaki Trails, we ran that modeling at least 15 times, trying to figure out how to Basically, what it means, very simplistically, is where the water goes now, it largely has to go when you mitigate. Because if you stray very far away from where it goes now, you will have these impacts if you have a larger storm. So we were trying to balance that out. If you know Wupaki Trail, some water's going down the east side, some water's going down the west side. So the engineers were trying to you know, try this, try this, try this, trying different levels of mitigation on each side. Our goal for our mitigation post Schultz pipeline, post pi pipeline, is to try to get to a 25 year post fire design storm. That's our goal. We didn't get there in Wapaki Trails. We could not get there because we could not meet these criteria. With, with the resources we had and the ability to construct what we were able to construct with the easements and everything that we had, we were not able to do that. So there's no guarantee in this corridor or any corridor we'll get to the post. Schultz was five year post fire design storm, but it still had a tremendous positive impact 
even during the pipeline flows. Those corridors would have been horrifically impacted if we did, had not had the mitigation that we did. So, um, and it, it varied depending on how much the watershed had burned during Schultz versus pipeline. Wupaki and government tank were the two that were less burned and then really now that's one of the reasons you and them are seeing the worst impacts. Any other questions on the no adverse impact before we let Corey sit back down? Okay, great. So um, moving into, so important point here, one of the big lessons learned out of Schultz was that we had to develop an integrated system. And frankly, we kind of did that, kind of fighting that concept originally. And thank God we did. Bless the Lord. We're in the Lord, how Lord's house that, that we made that decision to build, thank you, Pastor, to build an integrated system that involved the work on forests, that involved the work through the neighborhoods, involved the highway. And, you know, we secured about $7 million to construct the detention facility at Copeland. And so coming into this, it was frankly a no-brainer that we had to have this integrated system. And so that's the goal here again, is to have this integrated system. And so just reiterating the points for this corridor, this is going to be the most complex. We will spend as much in this corridor than we will in ev everywhere else, pretty much. I mean, we're, it's almost about half of the total money we've received will go into this corridor. And we're starting from square one, as it says. So what will the mitigation require? If it's going to require a significant amount, we're looking at spending upwards of $13 million on forest alone. And then in the neighborhood, I'll run through the numbers here with you, but neighborhood mitigation will be a combination of detention facilities, channels, potentially storm drain. We already know we need at least one highway crossing. That 36-inch has to increase. Um, so, and, and that's going through the engineering process is just determining then of those measures, how do you put the pieces of the puzzle together so that it works effectively and it meets the no adverse impact criteria. In terms of the funding, this is what we've secured. Uh, we have, and this is for government tanks solely. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to spend about $13 million in this corridor on forest. Alan will speak more to that next. Uh, the Flood Control District will contribute $6 million. That's our match. The Forest Services funding, we got a total of $42 million for all nine corridors. And um, they're funding that 100%. Some nominal costs that we're picking up, but... Um, but the, the, the construction and the engineering and so forth is all being covered 100% by the Forest Service. The off forest, the neighborhood mitigation, we secured a, a reimbursement grant from the Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, for $21 million. So the total, we have about $30 million to spend in this, in this corridor. So if you look at the grand total, it comes to $40.1 million out of about 90 million we got for all nine watersheds. Design consideration, what is it that Mark and Lizzie are looking at? We're, again, our target is this 25 year storm. Don't know if we'll be able to get there. We know, you know as you just saw, we're looking at something like 3,800 to 4,000 cubic, cubic feet per second. We need to demonstrate a positive cost-benefit analysis to the NRCS to be able to expend those funds. So we can't come in and gold plate, right? We got to we got to have practical, reasonable construction approaches. Um, we of course cannot create adverse impacts, as we've mentioned, and um, and again, just to reiterate, uh, and th and that process of ensuring that may reduce that design storm. We all, Wupaki, we probably ended up with at about 15, maybe 20 here that we're at probably. Yeah, yeah, some, you know, we ended up 
uh, but it will still have a very positive impact in that corridor. So, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alan to talk about what we're going to do on forest. And I didn't need this, and I held it the whole time. I'm oh, so used to it. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Alan Hayden. I work for a local engineering firm here called Natural Channel Design. Uh, and um, I think this is the first time that we've worked here in this corridor with you guys. Uh, fortunately, you didn't have to listen to us too much during the Schultz fires. But now, uh, now you might need us. So, um, our, what we're talking about on forest is watershed restoration. So, a little bit about what's going on in your watershed right now. There's been some really fundamental changes in the way that your watershed works. Okay, there used to be high elevation channels that were two feet deep, five or six feet across, came down, spread across the 420 road, went into a couple of cattle tanks, and then spread across a big wide alluvial fan, a big wide surface, hardly any channel in it at all. And that alluvial fan surface served to spread flows out, slow the flows down, and drop out all the sediment that might have come out of that hill slope. Um, and that's the way, that's the fundamental way that most of these watersheds around the base of the San Francisco peaks worked uh, before post-fire flooding. And Corey's talked about a you know, 26 uh, fold increase in flow and discharge from a given storm after the fires because of the state of the watershed. We don't have those, don't have the canopy, don't have the duff on the ground, and we have hydrophobic soil. So we get a lot more water. With that comes the power to do an awful lot of work. And that you guys are seeing that work in the form of sediment carried off the hill. And that sediment, um, while it's product of the water and we can't stop the water, um, that sediment, as you guys have already noticed, is going to get in the way of any kind of improvements that we want to do around your homes, under the highway, and on beyond the next set of homes because it will fill those channels, it will clog the culverts, it will clog the box culverts, and you'll be tr constantly trying to clean them out. And culvert that has 900 CFS, I guarantee you didn't see 900 CFS through it all last year. We saw 100 because it was full of sediment almost immediately. That sediment's also a problem for your homes, your houses, all of that cleanup stuff. So one of the, the lessons that we've learned, one of the strongest lessons we've learned during the Schultz fire and other fires all around the Southwest is that with this is increase in flow, and we can't do a whole lot about it, but we'll come in an increase in sediment, and we do have the tools to work with that. And that can make all the improvements that Mark and Lizzie can design through the house and under the highway and all that kind of stuff that can make that possible to work. Otherwise, they have a really hard job, an almost impossible job. So, let's talk a little bit about what's going on. This work? Oh yeah, cool. So, this is up in the upper watershed. This is kind of the condition you see. Those big flows, those July flows that came through overwhelmed those channels and eroded them down sank them down, in some cases, 10, 15 feet deeper than they were. Now, all of that sediment came down and landed down on the fans and down by you guys, and that's bad. That was just one storm, but this set up a condition now that will take a very, very long time to heal. These channels, shaped like this, with um, these steep banks, highly erodible banks, they don't have any greenery on them, don't have any root system, a bunch of loose sediment, 
will erode away, and it won't take much flow to make that move, okay? Poor condition channels, you can generally expect them to carry maybe four times to 10 times as much sediment as they did before they got into poor condition, just because there's so much there and because they're able to concentrate their flow against that sediment and put it into motion, okay? So this is what the upper watershed looks like, very deep, steep in size channels. These boulders right here, you know, that's a three and a half foot boulder. That's big. It's got a lot of power. It can carry a lot of stuff. This is what the lower watershed looks like. And this is what is kind of really impacting you guys the most is because these areas right here, you see this big broad valley right here? This was an alluvial fan system. This was a system where there was very little, if no channel, and those big high flows would have spread out, in some cases, a quarter of a mile or more, rather than be carried in a 10-foot wide channel and er, with highly erosive velocities. So now, these big features right here have been cut through, and in some places, they've been cut through deeply. So now we're taking all of that force of water and we're squeezing it in to a narrower and narrower channel. That narrower and narrower channel would like to widen itself back out and become a quarter mile wide again. Well, that's going to have to work through all of that five foot bank of sediment for a quarter mile back in order to make that happen. That's what the stream, this corridor, wants to do. All that sediment would come at you. So, what we, what our mission here for watershed restoration is to reduce the sediment supply whenever we can, to keep those incised channels from incising any further, to lay back the banks wherever we can, and that is a good shot, and we can take care of a good portion of our sediment source that way except we can't do that everywhere in the watershed. Once we get above the 420 road, there's wilderness areas and there's slopes that are 60, 70% slopes that are very, very difficult, if not impossible and dangerous to work on. We're not very effective at doing that kind of work. But what we can do is come down into the alluvial fan systems and put those alluvial fans back together and all of our modeling and all of our work from Schultz through the museum fire and through fires in New Mexico have shown us that if we can put the alluvial fan system back together, we can reduce the sediment transport across that alluvial fan by 75 to 95%. And that 5% that keeps coming, that's quite a bit of sediment, but that's in the neighborhood of what a standard pipe or channel through a neighborhood can carry easily. It's finer sediment, it moves along pretty easily, keeps those things clear. And if we can get to that point, we can use, utilize this alluvial fan system to reduce that sediment transport, store all that transported sediment up onto the alluvial fan system, which it has been wanting to do for the last 10,000 years, um, we can put it up there, restores the function of the forest, Forest Service likes that, and helps us downstream and helps the folks that are trying to help you guide the water around your houses in a big way. So um, I'm happy to, that is a, that's a week long kind of seminar in about five minutes. Uh, so I'm stick around all evening. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. But this is what it looks like up there now. These are the areas that we think we can do the most work in. Uh, this is, so here's government tank, here's the neighborhood down here, here's the pipeline, here's the Eldon Springs Road just to get you oriented, here's the 420 Road right here. We have pipeline above that, water line road above that, and wilderness above all of that. So these areas right here, very narrow valleys, that we have to, we don't have the ability to build uh, alluvial fans. They don't have the valley width to make it happen. So these are areas where we're gonna have to do 
grade control and prevent further incision. But the great news is that this government tank watershed has an ex the potential for an extremely long, extremely large, wide alluvial fan system, okay? I've got it broken up into two areas right here. This area right up here down from basically the, the old tank down to about the trend where the pipeline crosses, that's really well burned. There are not many trees standing. It is deeply incised and we will transform that with the help of Mr. Garrison and his crew into a big wide alluvial fan, which is a big slope downhill, big flat slope to spread flows out really wide. You put grade control in it so it doesn't cut gullies anymore. Down in here, this area is basically unburned right behind the houses. There's a lot of trees. There's also a lot of uh, uh, resource sites that we're trying not to mess with. And we have a different kind of alluvial fan system where we can set up the hydrology, the hydraulic dynamics of an alluvial fan without as much disturbance. And that's important to us because we want to kind of preserve as much of this as we can, and we don't have it to preserve up here. Um, once we get down to above the neighborhood, we can build what we call a terminal trench, okay? We bled out all the sediment across that alluvial fan. We got some muddy water coming in. That muddy water is spread over a really wide area, kind of like it is right now. What we can do at that terminal trench is a kind of a big hole in the ground, goes all the way across. We pick up all that flow, and then we can feed it in the direction that we want it to go into a direction where Mark and Lizzie tell us that they can build a channel that can hold a certain amount of flow. And we can feed that amount of flow to them out of that trench in a weir. This system has worked all up and down um, the, in the Schultz fire. We're utilizing it in the museum fire and we've had great results in over a decade of successes with it. And those successes came even last year when flows were far, far in excess of what the thing was ever designed to do in an engineering fashion, but nature and geomorphology kind of help us along the way. So we're trying to follow what the mountain and the flow path are telling us to do, what can happen out there, make sure that that does happen in the best way possible, the most efficient way, and uh, we can go from there. I want to point out a really important thing is this terminal trench is pretty important because the alluvial fan system keeps going. And you guys live on alluvial fan system. And you may have noticed your sediment is stopping and grading up. You've seen it piling up on your houses, piling up in ditches, culverts, everywhere. It wants to come here and move, migrate this alluvial fan system down the hill as far as it can because it's being overwhelmed with sediment and that's what alluvial fans want to do. Take that sediment, settle it out. So our job is to make this alluvial fan as efficient as possible so that we don't need this portion down here where your houses is and we can truncate this and put it into single thread channels and carry it through the neighborhoods. Does that, sure. Yes, sir. Has to leave out of that terminal trench in a channel, in a single thread channel. And I don't have those there because they haven't told me where that needs to go yet. But the terminal trench is a big, deep trench, be about 10, 15 feet deep all the way across here. All the water goes into it, can go out this end, go out that end, it can go out the middle, and you can also meter it out so that if it over exceeds the terminal trench, it goes right back to where it used to go. Uh, we don't know that yet. We, don't, we have to do the engineering yeah. to know that. That's why we yeah. need to get the right of entry form so we can do the engineering and then we'll come back and say, at 30%, we'll come back and say, here's the proposal as to where the channels, storm drains should go. Yeah. And, and how we're gonna manage that through the neighborhood. Well, there's some concepts we've been playing with, but they we need to get the on the ground engineering started. 
we need to have your right of entries and then we can start moving forward with that on the ground engineering get that data to put into the engineering and having been through this a few times and work with Corey and Joe on the no adverse impact portion of it it's most easiest to put it kind of where it's going right yeah. now so. in a more consolidated form so what does this look like in in real time in reality um, this is alluvial fan restoration that was done on the museum fire uh, over on Spruce Avenue Wash, just the other side of the hill. This is, um, this is an alluvial fan that's been cut through, much as yours. It's much shorter, it's only about 800 feet long, but that's a five foot deep channel. And you can see how much material it's been able to move out of that channel uh, and move downstream. So um, what we did was come back take this material and move it back into the channel. And this is the same place, you can see the same cut. Build up that alluvial, that uh, gully, and spread those flows out over a 300 foot wide alluvial fan at the bottom. Now, you take that amount of water, you spread it out like this, and you get little rivulets that are a few inches of deep and do not have the shear stress to carry water. So we don't see anymore. We see little rivulets forming in loose soils and some, some muddy water coming off there, but it is, can no longer has the capacity to move these kind of materials. So, Plus uh, there are sills in there too, right? Yeah, the and there's, the there's buried grade control in here, and I'll show you that in a minute, but that's the trick to keeping it going. This is what uh, great control in, in a building uh, the terminal trench looks like. Okay, this is that fan as they're building it, drops over. This is the road here. We used it as a terminal trench, gathered all that flow, moved it out the end and over the road. This is the terminal trench being built at Brandis, just up the road from you guys. Okay, it's a big deep trench, great control here to keep it from cutting back. Leave your fans back this way, gathers all the flow, and then you'll see over here just behind the excavator, there's an outlet. And that outlet goes to a channel. This is what our grade control system looks like. Really large rocks placed very carefully. Um, and these are, uh, the rocks are sized not to move under the design flows, but you place them in in a cross vein weir section like this, so it keeps the shear stress off of those eroding banks into the center of the channel, and then the grade control keeps the channel from dropping any further. This is what it looks like when it's being used. Okay. This is, uh, an, this is I told you that the lower area of, of your watershed, we're looking at using a new type of um, system to build back the alluvial fans. When we don't have deeply, deeply incised systems, this is Schultz Creek, and we've built a plug and spread alluvial fans. And, and basically, what you're doing is plugging the channel with a very stout plug made out of big rock and spreading the flows out onto the floodplain on either side. And you do that in a series all the way through the valley that you have available to build that alluvial fan in. Nice thing about this is that you can create an alluvial fan width, and this is be the riffle, if you will, for the alluvial fan, so it spreads water all the way across this valley, drops out sediment on the upstream side, and then spreads flows out, and it can't carry very much on the downstream side, so we're stopping sediment. The nice thing is, you can create this without having to clean all the trees and grade the whole thing out with a big bulldozer. Um, you can save a lot of resources doing this. Um, it's um, harder to design, a little harder to build, but in sensitive areas like Schultz, Schultz Creek Trailhead, we can do both. We can have our hydrologic alluvial fan and have trails, trees, aesthetics, and all that kind of stuff. And I think for the lower portion of your alluvial fan system, this is probably going to be a really good design practice. So, um, of course, with all of our work, we a big portion of this is to reseed those graded and disturbed areas. 
using native grass seeds and mulch it over using ground up trees that we get off the site so we're not importing a lot of uh, materials um, and get grass to come back up, hold those soils together, make the fan work for a long time. So that's the, that is the forest restoration portion of it. Uh, as Lucinda said, it's an integrated system. Um, we do the forest restoration to make the downstream portions work, okay? It helps the forest heal and puts it in the, going back in the right direction, but it makes the channels that you need downstream in a post-fire world possible. So, yes, you had a question. That's not a terminal trench. That terminal trench is below the surface. The what is out behind Johnson Ranch is a big berm, like a stock tank berm. Okay, uh, it allows water to come in and then slow down and then go out the side. So we can hold some water there. Okay, and prevent a volume of water from going downstream into into a Dony Park. And that's that's the purpose of those. And there's three of those berms. There's two downstream from the one you see right near the road. Mm -hmm. And that was all built on Forest Service property. Yeah. We also have two more sets of berm, two sets of berms, one set of berm, two berms. The, ex the, the original twins that were built west of the landfill road between like Campbell Avenue and landfill road, post Schultz, that have performed exceedingly well last year and prior. And then we built two more of those berms downstream. Um, so two new twins, so we got, yeah, so we've built five new berms this year. And, and that concept, part of the concept, and this will probably apply throughout this corridor, is you start your mitigation downstream and work upstream. You're much less likely to have those adverse impacts if you do that. All this work went through the no adverse modeling. Corey did all that modeling. And so, um, you know, what we're, what, one of the goals that we're trying to avoid and why people from Dony Park weren't invited tonight is that we're trying to avoid doing any construction in Dony Park. The reason why is it's a much denser area. It's flat. It's pretty much Dony Park is a lake, right? It's a historic lake area. Once it gets to Dony Park, there is really very, it's trying, eventually in a really massive storm, it would get down to the Rio. It's trying to get to the Rio, but it, it will pond in there. Most, many of you know what happened in Schultz when the flow went to the north. We had four feet of water in the homes. If you remember that, if you were here, um, it, and it'll just sit there and it sat there and sat there and sat there. So we'd have to look at injection wells. It was gonna be you know, probably upwards of just a hundred million dollars. So we're trying to see what we can do upstream, both on and off forest to be, and this is part of that whole system. Those berms are kind of one of the first steps. And, and but that's our goal, because otherwise we would have spent all the money in Dony Park, to be honest. So we needed to, we're trying to develop a system that we can avoid that. If, if you want to see good examples of a terminal trench and the channel that leads out of the terminal trench, go to the end of Campbell Avenue and walk up into the woods just a short ways up there. You'll notice a fan off to the right and that channel that comes right beside the road. And then you can walk to the west a short distance to the south paintbrush and north paintbrush uh, fans and terminal trenches. And so those are all, those were built during Schultz and uh, they've been maintained since, but they've worked really well. And Brandis as well. There's, there's. So you had one question, and I'm gonna give it back to you, Lucinda. Have you ever, there's not a lot of houses between. Mm -hmm. Now we can't spend a single federal dollar on acquisition of, and we're going to talk about that on a, land acquisition. No. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. 
we either spend money on land acquisition and can't construct anything, which is of no benefit. <laughs> so, you know, it's we and we can't spend any federal dollars on it. None. The good for constructing mitigation. Then you can't buy property with federal discounting funds. Um, that if you looked at the cost of purchasing the property, the mitigation will actually be much less in the end. So we did that analysis and it's much less. And, and we need to afford, again, an entire integrated system because this is also impacting people downstream of, of you, those of you that are in the switchback, you know, Heppel, Treadway area that water flowed all the way to Silver Saddle and beyond last year. And if we get a two inch event, like we would expect in this area, it was predicted to go at least to Eancey. So when you start adding all that up, then you start thinking about what that costs. It's, it's not feasible, so. There, there's no intent to do that. The intent is, Spend a ton of money, and the county's not going to come in three years later and say, hey, the, the, the intent right now, our, our design intent is, is not to exercise that effort, you know, is to secure donated easements and to move forward with mitigation. You know, that, that's the intent. The intent is not to, to exercise intimate domain. I can tell you that if we get down to one or two properties that don't want to cooperate, that decision will go to the board of directors and they'll decide if they want to exercise that for one or two properties. If there's a significant, I would say, even a moderate level of opposition to moving forward like there was in Copeland and the Peaceful Way areas last time, this, this is a service we're providing. If you don't want the service, we'll spend the money somewhere else where they want it. And that's what we did last time. We just moved to the other corridors, secured the drainage Jesus, and we moved forward with construction. And they're benefiting from that then, and now we've even made improvements to those features as well, again. So, you know, that's the decision. It's, that's, again, it's in your hands. It's pretty simple. We're not here to force you to do anything. We're here to work with you in partnership to try to effectuate an effective system of flood mitigation. It will not mitigate, it will, will not mitigate every flood event. You will still have flood events. In 2018, in Brandis area, we had a thousand year rainfall event, six inches in less than an hour. Did that mitigation make a huge difference actually, even though it was very, fairly small? It did. The whole, there were two homes that got water in the interior, None of them were in that area. They were outside of that area that was mitigated. Were there impacts to property? Yeah, but were there impacts to home? None. Now, we were fortunate in that case, very fortunate, but we also had that system there. These, these impacts from these fires don't go away quickly. Basically, what the system on forest is doing, when they design Schultz, they walk 65 miles of all these channels, and they went out and walked another probably 30, 40, 50 miles of channels around the peaks and similar areas to look at what happens after a fire. What happens at a fire that's 10 years old, 25 years old, 40 years old, 75 years old? What we're doing is advancing that recovery of that watershed, probably by somewhere between 75 and 150 years by what we're doing. It wants to get back to this condition as, as Alan, but it's going to take decades and decades and decades. We're putting that on steroids and moving that process forward so that it can recover much more quickly. This is a natural process. We're just advancing it by what we're doing. The other really important reason on the on forest measures is that those channels, when you look back at that map and when we looked at the map earlier, let's go back here to. So right now, let's look at the two inch and you'll see there's water bleeding off. And if you had a wider view, you'd see even more. This watershed right now is trying to really move to some degree to the north. 
right now. Two years from now, it might move back to the south. So what's co it's, it's going to be constantly moving. As, de as sediment builds up in one area, rock debris builds up in one area, it's going to push it to another. It's going to push it. So if you don't have that terminal trench, if you don't have these measures on force, collect up that water, and then have a system to transport it downstream more safely, it could change in two years. And you know, so you could say, well, right now, gee, we're not getting much impact. We don't really care, right? But you might be the recipient of water two or three years from now if we can't have some management of that water into an integrated system downstream because it will move constantly. That's what Louisville fans do. If you've ever been in a river and you've seen where the riverbed was over here, five years later the riverbed's over here, that's what it's doing, right? That's a natural process. And so we're trying to stabilize those national, national products. Right now it's tremendously unstable and it will keep migrating around um, for many decades to come. Uh, I've, I've walked parts of it. I have not walked the whole thing, but I was just up there Tuesday and saw all those huge channels he just showed you pictures of. Is that, is that the old tank? What is that? Whoever did the construction up there, if it was Tiffany or Rummel or whoever did it, you know, now they have directly channeled what you're talking about. What they've done is they've channelized it now. Right. And we didn't do that. That's we didn't the gas do that. line trying to protect their lines. We have some other ideas for them. And that part of our work is to work with the gas line. We also have to work with AT&T communication folks and as well as Dony Park Water, who has lines up there. And our part of our design work and part of Corey's independent modeling work is to show not only you how this thing works and that your homes are not going to be negatively impacted and will be better off, but also folks that are have resources in the forest, like transcontinental gas, transwestern gas, they did what they thought was best at the time. It's not really helping that much for what we're trying to do. And, help them what, and it's not eventually not going to help them very much because they've taken a widespread flow across their gas line, which was moderately erosive, and they've pointed the whole flow into a very narrow place, which will be highly erosive, and that gas line is going to get exposed. Not everybody understands these. Yeah, parts. so we have... Part of what we do is education, and it's not just to you guys. There's lots of people out there doing lots of things, and that's one of the reasons we're here. So. You keep talking about doing things, doing things to concentrate. Would the county have a representative, not a contract, representative, county? talk to the individual homeowners as to what's going on on their what's going to go on yep. on their property let me let me get into the next steps and we're going to talk that about that refreshing at yeah, that we will have that discussion absolutely so let me walk through the next set of steps here we walked through some of this earlier but this is really important to understand this process and and the level of steps so again first step is securing the rights entry so we can proceed with the archaeological survey, can proceed. I'll get catch your question in a minute here, ma'am. Um, proceed with the engineering, right? That's that's the critical next piece here. Move into the engineering. At 30, 60, 90 percent, we can pr conduct the, that no adverse impact analysis. We will have corridor meetings with you at 30 and 60 percent. 
Once we get to coming into 30% through 30% to 60%, that's when all that individual interaction is going to happen. Because at that point, we've got a pretty good sense about where the mitigation measures through the neighborhoods need to move. Now, those of you that are on properties that got very significant deep flows last year, be thinking you're probably going to see some mitigation, right? That there's probably going to be something that's going to involve your property and your property in particular we need a right of entry for. So we'll have corridor meetings, but there will be individual meetings primarily with the engineers because the engineers who work for the district they don't talk to us. If you want a county official, we can have a county official, but let me tell you, the people who will do the design work are sitting back here. They need to hear from you. You need to see what their concept is, what their proposal is for your property, what it means to your property, what it means to upstream and downstream properties. They need to have that individual conversation with you. That's the most productive. We know that, you know, me coming out and talking as a non-engineer is not going to effectuate what you need to know. Here's the so, so, okay. Here, now, I hear you. Finish. Okay. Here's the we problem. can go back. It can take people, time. People from the county, we get one person tells us one thing, another person tells us something else, a third person tells us something else. We get engineers come out and say, this is we're going to, what we're going to do, and if you don't like it, took too bad. Now, that's not the way to handle your residents. And that's what happens. Well, we are here to move forward with you. If you and want a right of entry signed, you have somebody come talk to me and show me what they're going to do on my property. We don't know yet. Until we do the engineering survey, True. then we'll have to go some other location, right? I mean, do, do you understand we have to have some basic you data? Understand? You have to have some basic. Spoken with and not dictated so, to. So I would encourage you to take it. We've had a lot of fair amount of communication. <laughs> We, no, uh, you a, haven't. a fair amount of communication. Switch back, you have Lizzie and Mark have been out in the community. So we can sit here and we can spend all night talking about what hasn't happened, what you want to see. Let's move forward, folks. We're here to move forward. I hear you. You want more communication. I hear you. We will do that. That's what this process is now about. It's, it's developing that plan, working with you to develop and execute that plan. So we can spend a lot of time bitching and moaning. I'll be very direct. Go ahead, go for it. I want you to understand what this process is about, and I'm hoping you're going to work with us so we can move forward. I'll take one more question, and then we're going to get through the rest of the slides. What he's talking about is the county came to us to do some stuff for this year, and it was you sign this paperwork, and we'll come do this. If you don't sign the paperwork, then. And for those of you that were offered that opportunity and you made a decision, and that's fine. We can have that conversation offline. I'm happy to have that conversation. I don't want to take up the time. I'm just trying to say is it didn't feel like the county was working with us. It felt like it was well, this or nothing. And that's all we were asking. So we've, we're, we've executed probably no less than 30 of those agreements in other areas right now and probably 30 to 50 during Schultz and a whole lot through how many in Mount Eldon Estates, another 30 up there prior. So Think we've used the that. same exact process. Think so so say your that, piece, but then that, I'm moving that, on because these people, on us right. His son said, we're going to do this stuff around your house that you might not really want, but you, you agree did. to that. If you don't agree to that, we're not going to do anything. Number one. That's right. Number right. Because that's the engineer number plan. Two, right. If you agree to it, then you're responsible for keeping that channel open. That's because, what that's what because that was a system to benefit that set of properties. And you may come back and you may still want that. So be careful what you say now, because in the end, when the end mitigation plan comes forward, you may still want that plan. So be careful. Like <laughs> be careful. And if you don't, that's fine too. So, 
the one that Mark brought out. I took it to a him region. He told me I'd be stupid if I. And that's his opinion, and he's entitled to it. And I got hundreds and hundreds of people who have signed that form with fully consented by attorneys. So we can debate, again, we can spend all night debating this. I'm going to move on. If you want to talk about that situation, right now, it's that works off the table. You didn't want, that's fine, no problem. We're moving forward. We're going to focus on long-term mitigation. That's why we're here. That's the goal. That was interim mitigation. We're talking about moving forward with long-term mitigation. So with that, I'm... We're, we're looking at, at long-term mitigation going forward. Doesn't take a year. It took us about nine months, uh, about 10 months to actually get the money. That's the fastest it ever happened ever. So, okay, so these are the approvals that we need to secure both on and off forest. This is part of the process. So right of entry, what's a right of entry? Right of entry, again, doesn't obligate the property owner to do anything. Doesn't allow for any construction, doesn't obligate the property owner to do anything. All it does is allow the district, and it's primarily its consultants, the engineers, to conduct this work that they need to do to be able to develop that conceptual plan to come back to you with a plan. There's, we can't, if they can't do that work, they can't come back to you with a plan that they have any reasonable confidence could work, right? And will pass through NAI or anything else. So those, we need those forms signed and we really can't initiate much engineering without that because that survey work Understanding the topography and so forth is critical. Yes? I think everyone or many here are concerned about that. Very, very little implication because it doesn't obligate you to do anything. It doesn't obligate you to provide a drainage easement. It doesn't obligate you to any specific design. It, it obligates you to allow, when that engineer comes to do the work, the survey team comes, to allow them to be on your property. It is private property. We cannot enter your property without that right to enter your property. That's all it allows us to do. That's it. Before? You can indicate on the form if you want to be in, uh, contacted prior. So I'm curious, I know Mark and Lizzie were up there already doing some stuff. I never signed anything for them to do some well, surveying and stuff. Mostly so far, it's been the short-term mitigation. And certainly, they've been driving around and they've talked yep. to some people. But I've, they've been on my but property, their stakes. Survey. They have not done the, okay. the real work that has to underlie construction engineering. You know, the basics of construction engineering that have to take place. Okay. So that's right entry. Once we get to the 60% engineering level, having communicated with you and worked through to that process, then you're gonna be presented with a drainage easement. And the drainage easement does, does then allow the district to actually construct. Okay. Right of entry does not, the drainage easement does. Drainage easement is basically providing a right to a, th a third party, in this case, the, the flood control district, to construct some form of flood mitigation on your property. It, again, we don't know exactly what that's gonna look like yet, whether it's a channel, storm drain, you know, what that measure might look like, berm, whatever that might be. Not gonna probably be any berms in this, frankly, in this piece of it. Um, but um, it provides that right, and it allows us to access your property and, and do that construction, and it obligates the district to perform all the future maintenance. So you, we secure that easement. That easement articulates that legally the district is accountable for 
all the future maintenance in perpetuity. It's an easement, meaning you retain the ownership of the land, much like there's a prop in some of your properties, there's a road easement, right? For others to in have ingress and egress off of it within your development. It's similar to that, but in this case, it's for drainage and for drainage only. There will be typically a J, if it's a channel, there will be a, a, a narrow access road to be able to maintain that adjacent. That's a component of that easement. If it's a storm drain, that's probably going to be incorporated in with that easement more, more readily. But we have to be able to have access in the future because if there's maintenance needed, we're responsible for the maintenance. Yes? Everything's agreed upon and you put this, this, this flow in. Um, are we legally responsible or liable five years, 10 years down the road if that water does something else at the end and hurts another family down the road? It, because it went through our property. You know, that, that's a legal question and that really requires an attorney to answer. We, if you think about this from a legal perspective though, who's doing the engineering? The county. District, not the, okay. this is not the county, it's the district, it's a separate legal entity. The district has the authority to do flood control, the county does not. So the, the legal authority in this state by law is the flood control district. So the flood control district's doing the engineering. Who's doing the construction? Whoever's the hired, district. Right. Right. the district. The district will hire contract, Tiffany, other contractors, right? right? Who's doing the maintenance? The district. Right. So when you're looking at the risk liability equation, it's very limited what the property owner, right? Because you haven't done the engineering, you're not sealing those plans, Mark is. You're not constructing, and, and he and his team and inspectors will inspect those measures and determine if they were constructed appropriately, right? Sure. I mean, and then if you think about, if somebody's gonna sue somebody, who do they think has the more resources and has the accountability? Right, and, that, and that's so fair. I'm not saying that it alleviates you 100% of no responsibility or liability, but let's be really clear about what that equation looks like. The district is, is saying, we're gonna take this accountability. And this was, I mean, this remains a, a, a you know, like this was a huge decision for the board post Shoals whether we would even go in and start doing these types of measures because we were accepting the vast majority of that liability. So the easement that we might sign wouldn't say, hey, I, Joe Schmo, homeowner, uh, am- there, there will be a certain level of indemnification and those types of things in that agreement. Um, but, but also though, you have to look at that in the context of, Who's making the decisions and who's controlling those assets? They are flood control district assets, right? Yeah. When you go out and you put in your own mitigation and, and you choose to do certain things, you're taking 100% of the liability then. And that's why when if you got concrete barriers at your home or if we place sandbags, you signed a cooperator agreement. You know who I that, am then. You know, then you then you said, right, you're allowing us to come on your property and you're sharing it to some degree in that risk. But we also identified where those barriers would go so that very unlikely they would create downstream impacts or upstream. So that's the purpose of having engineers perform those exercises and not random people in the community, right? Whose interest is maybe only their own and not others. I don't want to be a lucky recipient of your letter that now says you're going to come up and remove some barricades that I've placed. One, you didn't place the barricades for your original drawing to start with, so it was in the wrong there. Well, they should have been, and, the, and well, that exhibit should have been corrected if they weren't for some reason, if there was some obstacle or issue. So, and it, that's a personal issue. Let's take that. Rich, let's take that offline. Let's take that offline. You and I can talk about that later. 
Well, I know you've had a lot of discussions with a lot of discussions with Mark. So I know I don't want to talk about it. We, you and I, well, that's your personal issue. You moved your berries. You're creating downstream impacts. I'm not going to accept that. Sorry. So what is a drainage easement? Drainage easement, again, is that right? We talked about this that again, we're gonna go through a process, an engineering process to identify what the location is. It will not, very, very unlikely would affect the zoning of your property. You'll retain all the rights of whatever zoning you're in now. What most of you are two, two and a half, two acre, right? Five acre parcels, um, you'll retain that associated uh, zoning. It will not allow for any public access on your property. These drainage easements are not for the purpose of recreation. They're not for the purpose of other types of uses. They're for the purpose of drainage. There may be some locations, particularly over in the Johnson Ranch area, where forest access is very important to people, where in fact we may need to identify access points and work through with the property owners on those. But, uh, but that isn't, these aren't set up to be public access. It will limit what you can do in that area of your property. For the most part, we've typically tried to share the easements on property lines so that the easement is within the setbacks. That isn't always possible, depending upon what's needed in a corridor, but that is a lot of time our goal that we try to achieve that that the easements are shared between property owners and that it's within the area which are your setbacks, which means you can't build there anyway. Because obviously once we build a structure there, you can't build structures there. So, because that would obviously influence the flow um, or damage if it's uh, underground storm drain. No, we have to have it. We have to have a drainage easement, whether it's within the setback or not. But we try to identify areas within that setback, right? So that because you can't build there anyway. So, to answer my question, to have less impact on your property. So that the flood. Control district can come in and build on we, that. We, or set only back if we get a drainage easement from you. Only okay. if you agree to it. Okay. On my five and a half acres on Copeland Lane, and how do I get someone to come out and? Um, uh, show me what I need to do. Right of entry, no problem. Um, I just, I need help and it's so beyond anything I can we're do. we're moving forward with the engineering there as well. Excuse we have me? secured all the rights of entry and we're moving forward to the 60% level there. I don't know, you should be, I mean, we, we had a corridor meeting there recently and if you're not getting emails or you're not getting mail or something, then you need to talk Talk to Shirley back there and make sure, and Sean, make sure you're getting the communications. Because Okay, I, I need um, right. communication by mail rather than email. Yeah. So make sure, see Sean and Shirley, okay. make sure that Shirley. Okay. we have the correct mailing address for you. So we, there's been a lot of communicating with that court, or believe me. Yeah, a lot yeah, going on. So, and we are moving yes. forward there because we have secured all the rights of entry. Drainage easements, will you be compensated? As I mentioned before, we can't use the federal funding in terms of what the district funds that we have. We either buy easements or we do construction. That It's a simple equation. We don't have the money to do both. All through Schultz, I think I mean, we, we acquired hundreds of drainage easements that were all donated, hundreds. Same with museum, all the 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 easements were donated. You may be entitled to income tax benefit from your donation. It's considered a donation to the government. We will do a valuation of the property that's utilized for within that drainage easement. 
and we will provide that documentation. It's done by a professional uh, appraiser, independent of the district, uh, that's hired to do that, perform that task. That information is provided to Tierra Rightaway Services. They put all the documentation together that you can then take to your tax preparer to see if you qualify for that donation. Everybody's tax situation is different, but I know the vast majority of people that did this within Schultz were able to get a tax deduction based on that valuation. And I don't know a whole lot more. I'm not an accountant, so I don't know a whole lot more about that. But certainly, you can once you get that documentation, you can have that conversation, and you'll be able to uh, work with your tax preparer. And in that package, we follow the Federal Uniform Act, even though we're frankly not required to. That's the act that 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 dictates how property is acquired by governments. And that this package, this notice of intent, the offer package, that set of information that's provided follows that process. And that is the process that Tierra will be following as they, as they work with you to secure that easement after you've had the conversations with the engineer about what's going to occur on your property and answer those questions. So as I've been saying, there'll be a lot of interaction, particularly between the 30 and 60 percent, and um, and then both at the 30 and 60 percent, we'll be holding. This is the kickoff meeting. We will have those meetings. I think right now we're targeting 30 percent, probably sometime mid to late September in that time frame. Uh, and we've talked about these other steps. Um, we don't have a lot of time to navigate that securing those drainage easements if we, if we intend to construct before next monsoon season. But if this, if the group of people say we need more time to think this through and we want to take more time, we can take more time. But it likely will mean we would not meet that deadline. We, we have so much construction and engineering to perform. If we don't get these easements, Probably by early November, we won't make that deadline of constructing and having construction completed before next monsoon. No, because we 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 have to have somewhere safe for the water coming off the forest to go once it leaves the forest, and that was demonstrated once again in you know in spades after after Pi Schultz and then pipeline that. We have to have this integrated system. The water has to be able to go somewhere coming off for us because this, the measures that Alan is going to you know, design and ultimately it'll be constructed by Tiffany on forth, they do to some extent reduce the water, but they don't, this is about sediment reduction, not water reduction. So the water still has to go somewhere and we're responsible for where that water goes. If we don't have a system downstream, then we can't effectuate that. So, so it has to be a system. So we can't start the work on forest. There's some work we will be doing on forest in support of work that we're doing in our partnership with the Forest Service. So you may, you'll see him up there working, but we won't do the major mitigate until we have secured all those drainage easements because we have to be able to guarantee that we can get the water safely through the neighborhood that meets the NAI. So are you saying there is no preliminary idea at all of where these easements are gonna go? Well, we have some very early conceptual ideas, yeah, we do. At this point, we're not prepared to share those. We need to do additional engineering before we're ready to, to share those. Do you have any estimates on when the 30 and 60% plans would be ready for review? Um, 30% we're targeting like mid to late September, probably be about another 30, 45 days after that to get to 60. This is if everything falls in place perfectly <laughs> and we don't have other issues that surface. So that's, it just depends on what we can design, what's feasible, right? We're trying to get to the 25 year. 
it may ultimately not be feasible, right? So um, in Wupaki Trails, we have a 20 foot wide trench or channel that's about three to four feet deep. Um, that is conveying what about 800 to 1000 CFS. Uh, in Brandis, we're at about 1100 now. You can go up and look at Brandis. You can see that we've shot creek all the channels now that we're, that we're either expanding or, well, we expanded some of most the upper part of Campbell. Uh, we're moving to shot creek. We used post Schultz. We used this material called turf reinforcement mat. As soon as the fire hit, it was all gone and downstream. So we're moving all to shot creek. Fenced off also on your property? Yeah, they would be fenced off. They have to be fenced off for, for safety. And the fencing is installed as part of the, the mitigation. So what if the NAI is not achievable? What the then typically what it means is you have to reduce the level of mitigation that you can provide. Or what we have. I can't think of any property where we have done work that we have consumed probably, I don't know, I'm thinking about anywhere near that level. <laughs> like we're probably at 10%. I'm looking at Julie, like thinking about very fairly small percentage. I mean, most of these easements have been 30 feet width divided among the property owners, you know, so back-to-back -back property lines, 15 feet, 15 feet. This corridor, because of the flow, is probably going necess to necessitate a larger channel. But then you also have the opportunity to potentially use storm drain. And we're balancing act, you know, because we have to look at what's feasible with utilities, what's feasible, you know, from a cost perspective, environmentally, et cetera, right? So... They're good, but all those tools are in their toolbox for them to look at what measure best can meet the design dynamics of that particular area. So, yeah, and like I said, historically it's been more like 15 feet, you know. So. Right, and and it, and and they've got to work through what are the those options, right, in terms of trying to manage that. But we're looking at every option. We're looking at storm drain, which obviously has a lot less impact. It's underground. These are pipes underground. You're going to see manholes. That's about it, right? You're going to have an inlet at the top, and you're going to have culverts to take it across the highway. So. But we don't know if that's even feasible yet. But that's part of what they've got to get the information to make some de decisions, right? We're working very closely already with the utilities, secure that data, et cetera. Drainages, if take for example, Heppel and, and Switchback, private roads, private, private roads, mm -hmm. all kind of screwed up now. And if you go putting drainages through the roads, which you'll have to do to get them through the neighborhood, do you take over the road? Or do you maintain the road? Or uh, do you... I wouldn't assume that they'll go down the roads. Well, they have to cross a road. I, I would not assume that they'll go down the roads. The drainages will go down the road. I wouldn't make that assumption. I'm not saying they, down. I'm not saying down the road. I'm saying they would cross a road. They would cross them somewhere. Yeah, I, I don't want to make any assumptions. If, if, if they we have them. to cross the road, we will be responsible for maintaining that crossing. So if there's a box culvert, storm drain, you know, whatever's used to cross that road, the district will be responsible for maintaining that crossing. We will not be responsible for maintaining the road, but we would be responsible for maintaining the crossing. And if you don't get everybody to sign off, like one person holds out, then it's null and void? That is a decision that will be made by the board of directors. Do they then go to condemnation? I, I think there is an, 
given the level of impact and the fact that we spent $9 million on response and short-term mitigation, we cannot afford to do that over and over again for the next five to how many ever years. So that's part of what's, you know, and the impact of all of you, you know, the impact to the community, to the economy that this is having. So the board has to weigh that out. Does it make sense if there are a couple of holdouts to go with condemnation? That'll be their decision. If it's a small number, I am certainly prepared to take that decision to the board. I will tell you that. And in the other corridors, this has been the same discussion. So I think, you know, certainly in Copeland, we're, I think we're pretty close. If this, if this trench or ditch covers a huge part of your property, is there any consideration for a bridge that goes over it to make your property usable on both sides? Well, the goal would be to not split your property for that. Well, I get it, but it goes right down the middle of my property, so I don't see how it's not good. So, so yeah, okay. these questions are great for the 30 For sure, for sure. <laughs> when you actually see something on the ground, right? For sure. On a plan that would be on the ground. And, so, and yes, we do. So exam, you look it up or go drive up Upper Campbell. The end of Campbell, we did put the ditch along the road there because the various factors we were able to put the channel along this roadway and we had to construct. Understand that the federal government doesn't cover any of the road crossings. So that cost is a huge cost. Doing a bridge at each one of those driveways was extremely expensive. Same thing on Brandis. But we had the easement there. So we don't have any easement in this area. All the roads are private, as you know, except for Northwork. Yet it's a huge undertaking and it's a, it seems like a royal pain in the ass for everybody. It's a royal pain in the ass for everybody. But we agree. I just hope the county is willing to work with homeowners because everybody's property is different. Yeah. And everybody gets affected differently. Yeah. And That's they don't right. say it's this way or no way. And you can pack it in your ass, if you will. But, but you need to understand that it is a system, right? Yeah. And first off, one thing. Anytime you try to turn a channel or turn a storm drain, it doesn't work real well, right? You know that from the own, your own piping in your home, right? Where are the weak points? Those are the weak points. So, and that's the points, particularly in the channel system, where you will get adverse impacts because it'll overflow the channel in those higher storms, right? Above the design storm. So every time, you know, all these considerations have to play. So there's some flexibility, but, you know, you can't go from a 10-foot channel to a 15-foot, back to a 5-foot, up to a 30. It doesn't work that way. That's not the way water flows. There's some principles here of physics that they can't change. I can't change. You can't change, right? So it's going to take flexibility. We're going to try to do the best we can to work with you. The, the goal will be for it to go to the berms and go out to the cinders and soak in. You know, slow it down enough and have it soak in. Which berms? The berms that are on, off, on, off of Landfill Road. Now the goal again is to try to keep it out of Doney Park because the expense of constructing there is tremendous. Yes, ma'am. Get it across 89. The drainage ditch that's there and it runs parallel to my property, APS has just destroyed it and has loaded it up with dirt on, on the north side of it. Now, the Corps of Engineers was out there when we had the Schultz fire. They were going to come in and they were going to clean it out. It was about 12 feet deep. Oh. It has been filled up with about eight feet now. And the problem is, and the Corps of Engineers did not touch it because it's got a natural curvature like a river. It slows down when it comes through there and kind of filters out. It does flood the property to the so, east of it a little I'm bit. Just, I mean, you know, we're not prepared to have that kind of individual discussion about each individual. individual I understand situation. that, but. I, I will have... say that ADOT has been out doing some maintenance along the highway. Um, we have done maintenance in the systems that we own further to the north. 
Um, you know, they've done some trying to clean up the area, right, the ditches there and so forth. Um, again, I where where are you exactly? On the solar station. Are you in Johnson? You're in Johnson Ranch or the other side? Sweet Acres. Yeah. And is it a roadside ditch? It's a ditch that runs past. Right. It's a drainage ditch. It is dedicated mm -hmm. to drainage. We're in 36 inch culvert. Yeah. I mean, we, well, it's not our culvert, it's ADOT's yeah. culvert, but yeah. Yeah. No, I know where you're talking about. I mean, we, I can look at that. We can look at, make a note of that, Lizzie. Let's look at who owns that. I'm not sure if it's AP. I'm not sure who has, they own it. Okay. Well, I'll call APS, you call APS, and we'll bug them. <laughs> but I will tell you that after the first event, it will fill up again. So until he does his work, none of the maintenance it's a feel good thing. It doesn't have a lot of impact. It'll have impact for a few minutes and it'll be over. It'll all fill up with sediment. It's not full of sediment. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get, we'll all let them know that their people would like to see it maintained. Yes, ma'am. So this, oh, sorry. Sorry. this uh, right, of, uh, right of entry form, there's no date on it. So in other words, is this like a blank check that you know, and there should be. I, there's, there's you, typically it's in effect for like six months, it, we and we can add that to it. Yeah, because there's no yeah, it's, until it's typically six months longer. Big, you know, projects that we're taking a longer time and maybe a longer time, but typically it's six to nine months. Because we that we doesn't provide us the legal access to your property. Owner says you can come on my property. Doesn't matter. I have to have it. I have to have you sign a form agreeing because I may come on your property and you decide you don't like me being on your property and then you know you get upset and then they're the you know they're gonna say, hey, did you have the right? I didn't have the right, you can sue me. And I will have no no right whatsoever to have been there. You you surely have a right. I, I do not. I just I do not. I just spent 20 years in law enforcement. Of, of course you have a right. If if your property owner allows Only, you on the property you have a right to be on the property. Yeah, I. But I, I mean, that, that's not to trespassing. do what we need to do. I do not have the right to come on that property and do that. But I you're just coming right to look at it. Right? I mean, the, no, the we have a survey crew. Look, we'll have, you know, people out there potentially. If it moves, you know, there's something where we may need to do some potholing for utilities. I can't predict exactly what will have to happen, but we need to do the preliminary to even get to that. So, just got a few more slides. This meeting recap. I think we touched on this. The all these points. Um, you know, again, we're ready to move ahead, folks. Um, talking about the criteria, what's needed. We've talked about the drainage easements, mortgage releases. So once again, emphasizing this, we will only get mitigation implemented if we have the full and expeditious cooperation of those who need to participate. So, yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, what does it mean by, I know what entry on, you want to come on my property, over, under, and across? Potentially in some locations, there may be utilities that we need to do small potholes to determine what the depth is. So you may have a gas line or a water line or a utility line that runs through your property. It may save, serve more than you. It may just serve you, your service. But we need to understand where that is so that as we engineer, and they'll give us, they'll give us their drawings. Um, let me tell you, some are better than others. <laughs> and you know, for, for public safety and other reasons, and for basic engineering, we need to know where those utilities are. What is a pothole size? Uh oh, I, I don't know what that is. Typically, what are they, Mark? Two to three feet across? A pothole for utility? Yeah. Two, two to three feet, and they fill it back in, compact it back in. It's, it's done, they measure the depth. 
typically, you know, they'll measure the depth. There's a specific company in this area that does the vast majority, Allen Adams. Anybody that does construction knows Allen Adams. He's been here a million years. Great guy. Yeah, so. there, And not, not every property has to have that. We have enough understanding about where utilities are on a property, typically that, and again, if we're in the backs of the properties, typically there aren't, but sometimes there are. You know, if we are going down roads where utility, that's one of the reasons we try to avoid going down roads is that's where all the utilities are, right? Either in the road or adjacent to the road. And that's another cost that's not covered by the feds, just utility relocation. So I know with the, with the terminal trench plan and everything, you can't share that over there. I mean, are, are we potentially looking at a, a hypothetical that we can all look at that's saying that terminal trench is going to be on that on that west side of Heppel and Switchback, and that's going to terminate most of that flow coming down through government through and across the highway. I mean, is it going to, or are we looking at, you know, some people are going to have huge trenches coming through the property, like they've said, or is the most of it going to be mitigated on that west end to come around either way? You know, I in general. I think in general that that would be a goal. Is the one of our key goals is to try to have the least amount of impact on private property. But there is we have to get through the private property and get back through to the forest service on the other side, right? Um, because you don't want all the water in your just sitting in your neighborhood either. I understand. Right? That's where we're at now. <laughs> but the terminal trench can't be made, so you have these. Correct. Right. Correct. Could you, okay. elaborate, could you elaborate a little bit on the, if the board decides there's a couple properties that are holdouts in the condemnation process? Can you elaborate on Combina that? Condemnation. Um, yeah. The district, if the board approved going to condemnation, there's a condemnation document that is filed with the court. The judge reviews that. And... A very large percentage of the time, if it's a demonstrated public benefit, which the district has to demonstrate that there's, this isn't for just, we're doing a kickback for our friend here, right? Um, that there's a broad public benefit to that and seems, you know, appropriate for what's being done. Um, that judge will rule in favor of the district and we take immediate possession of the property. So we can then begin to move forward. The whole debate, and the whole debate, no, there is compensation. The whole debate becomes the compensation, frankly. And then, you know, our professional appraiser puts forward his or her documentation, and the judge looks at the private property owner, probably puts forward an appraisal as well, and there's some discussion. Um, that's why we follow the Uniform Act, so that if we go to condemnation, we've got everything set to go. We can go fairly quickly, probably a very large percentage of the time. We will get ruling in our favor. We'll get immediate possession, and the valuation will remain the same. Yeah, you know, that's just typically what would occur if a government actually followed the process. All right, so ending on monsoon, we may or may not have one, it sounds like, but you know, we all expect that we will. We certainly need rain, if for nothing else, so we don't have more fires. As we have repetitively put out uh, this season, make sure you've renewed your flood insurance, got your mitigation, all those mitigation plans that were placed onto the website last year, they remain there, and you know, ensure that your mitigation's in place and sign up for emergency notification. I imagine the vast majority of you have done so. Um, if you have further questions, this is our email address. And certainly if you aren't receiving our weekly emails that Sean and I author, please, please sign up. We do not sell emails to anyone. It, it, you won't get a bunch of junk mail as a result of this, I promise. And we've never had an issue with that ever. Um, and uh, Please sign up because that's how the most effective way for us to communicate with you. And frankly, during the entire flood season and when we need, if we do need to work with you in terms of access and all that, having your cell or having a home phone number is really 
really helpful. So again, we're going to be moving at light speed, people. And so the more, the more readily we can get in touch with you, um, we had in a, one of the other quarters, we had difficult contacting one of the property owners, finally tracked them down where they were living. And, um, and they were very extremely cooperated. They just hadn't been involved in any of the process to date, even though they're right against the forest in another corridor and being impacted. So, so anyway, again, appreciate you all being here this evening. And, um, you know, I hope we can all look forward and get some great work accomplished and mitigate a lot of the impact to your neighborhoods. That's right. We're well aware of that. <laughs> we're, we're looking at all opportunities for retention detention. Absolutely. Yep. And that property is zoned for detention. I mean, it was platted. I should say it's platted for detention. So we're, we're well aware of that. All right, any other general questions? Any other general questions? Yes, ma'am. Has a fence on it, and you, it's it's deemed that that would be a good place to put a drip ditch for adjacent properties. What happens to that fence? We will reconstruct a fence adjacent to the to, channel. Okay. Um, the the design standard we've set right now is horse wire that's welded, so it's the smaller. Oh, good. You know, rectangular, mm -hmm. and it's welded. It's not just yeah. the cheaper fabrication. It's actually welded. And so, posts. And there'll be T posts. T posts. You know, okay. Yeah. And posts, I mean, it meets a standard. Yeah. There's a pretty specific standard that we have. And what were the dates that you would like to have these by? I know you want them tonight, but. Well, I'll tell you, I would, if, if by the time we get to 30, you know, right now, we can't get to 30%. So that? we're, we would hope to be meeting with you mid to late September, but I can't keep that date if I don't get the rights entry. And again, for those of you that had pretty significant amounts of water on your property last year, some of you had a lot less, you're, you're probably less a part of the equation, right? Because the water to a large extent has to meet some of those, that flow criteria, otherwise we violate the NAI. So um, we don't necessarily need, I think there's 140 properties in terms of who was invited and who, you know, and look who's here. It's probably most of you that are probably being heavily impacted um, and that's why you're here. But I, I can't make that assumption either. You're welcome to take it with you. Drop it back by the Public Works Office at the end of Commerce. Uh, you can scan it and email it to us. You can mail it to us. Shirley will provide you know, our address information if you, or I think it may well be on there as well. So you can take it with you. If you want to review it further, absolutely. I mean, I'm asking tonight if people are comfortable with doing that. I'm not forcing anybody to do anything. So. Can we put on there uh, effective until? Yes, you can. I would prefer for you to give us like till the end of the year. Yeah, so six months. If we, yeah, if we get delayed or whatever. If we need to cut, if something extends or something changed, we need to come get another one, we'll get another one. Thank you, and you know, it's been a rough road. Hang in there, hang in there.